Good evening, everyone. Like pretty much everything else in our lives right now, tonight's service will be different from any other Maundy Thursday service you've ever been a part of. That does not make it any less meaningful. In fact, it is my hope that our time together tonight will be very memorable and will draw us closer together, even though we are so far away from one another. Will you please pray with me? Father, in your infinite wisdom and mercy, you have brought us together tonight to reflect and to remember. As we spend time with you tonight, we pray that you will open our hearts to receive your holy word and to better understand the events of so long ago. Gather your children, O God, and surround us with your loving arms. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that you have put together your bread and your juice so that you may receive Holy Communion. As always, Jesus will guide us through this time. I will be reading from not only the scriptures, not only the gospels, but I will also be sharing some words from my favorite Christian author, Max Licato, with you tonight. But I would like to start by reading from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 26. I'll be starting at the 17th verse. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Jesus replied, Go into the city to a certain man, and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your home. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. We thank you, Father, for this gift of bread. May it be for us the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we eat this together, may we do so in remembrance of him. And after they had finished the meal, Jesus took the cup. And once, once again, he gave thanks to his heavenly Father. And he said to his disciples, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, the new covenant, the promise of eternal life. And together they drank. Jesus said to them, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. As 
I continue, allow me to share with you excerpts from Max Licato's book entitled, And the Angels Were Silent. It was nearly midnight when they left the upper room and began to descend through the streets of the holy city. They passed the lower pool and exited through the fountain gate. The roads were lined with tents and fires of the Passover pilgrims, most of whom were asleep. But even those that were still awake thought little of this small band of men walking down the dusty road. At the same time that Jesus and the disciples were beginning the ascent up the path to Gethsemane, the twelfth apostle, the one who had just had his feet washed by the master he was about to betray, scurried down a street inside the city walls. His heart had been claimed by the evil one, and the final encounter of the battle was about to begin. As Jesus climbed the path with his disciples, he looked back at Jerusalem and saw what the disciples could not see. He saw Satan, the host of hatred, the master of death, open the dark cavern and prepare to receive the source of true light. All hell was breaking loose, and Jesus knew it. He knew that before the victory would come defeat, he knew that before the light of Sunday would come the blackness of Friday. Jesus turned back and began the final ascent to the Garden of Gethsemane. When he reached the entry gate, he stopped and looked at his companions one last time before they abandoned him. But he didn't accuse. He didn't lecture. Instead, he spent his last moments in prayer for them. Reading from the Gospel of John, beginning at the sixth verse of chapter 17. Jesus prayed for his disciples, saying, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, Father. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know everything that you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. But Jesus didn't just stop after he prayed for his disciples. He also prayed for you and for me. And he prayed to his heavenly Father using these words. My prayer is not for them, meaning the disciples, alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me 
that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, through the world, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may also be in them. turn now to another portion of Max's writing. Never had Jesus felt so alone, so alone. What must be done, only he could do. An angel couldn't do it. No angel has the power to break open hell's gates. A man certainly couldn't do it. No man has the purity to destroy sin's claim. No force on earth could face the force of evil and win, except for God. The spirit is willing, Jesus confessed, but the flesh is weak. His humanity begged to, to be delivered from what his divinity could see. Jesus, the carpenter, peered into the dark pit and begged to his heavenly father, can't there be another way? Did he know the answer before he asked the question? Did his human heart hope his heavenly father had found another way? We don't know. But we do know that Jesus asked to get out. We know that he begged for an exit. We know that there was a time when if he could have, he would have turned his back on the whole mess and gone away. But he couldn't. He couldn't because he saw you. Right there in the middle of a world that isn't fair. He saw you cast into a river of life you didn't request. He saw you betrayed by those you love. He saw you with a body which gets sick and a heart which grows weak. He saw you in your own garden of gnarled trees and sleeping friends. He saw you staring into the pit of your own failures and the mouth of your own grave. He saw you in your garden of Gethsemane, and he didn't want you to be there alone. He wanted you to know that he has been there too. He knows what it's like to be plotted against. He knows what it's like to be confused. He knows what it's like to be torn between two desires. He knows what it's like to smell the stench of Satan. And perhaps most of all, he knows what it's like to beg God to change his mind and to hear God say so gently but firmly, no. For this is what God said to Jesus. And Jesus accepted the answer. At some moment during that midnight hour, an angel of mercy came over the weary body of the man in the garden. As he stood, the anguish was gone from his eyes. His fists would clench no more. His heart would fight no more. The battle is won. You may have thought it was won on Golgotha. It wasn't. You may have thought that the sign of victory was an empty tomb. It isn't. The final battle was won in Gethsemane. And the sign of conquest is Jesus at peace amongst the olive trees. For it was in the garden that Jesus made his decision. He would rather go to hell for you than go to heaven without you. Amen.